Hi, I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company, and thank you so much for tuning into one of our talks today. We are a year-round talk series bringing you the best creative voices across film, television, theater, and entertainment. And today we're incredibly lucky to be joined by the director, Ben Rickey, to talk about his latest film, The Reunited States. And, and the genesis of this film really came from you seeing Susan Bro, who is Heather Heyer's mother, talking and, and really putting herself out there and having a lot of difficult conversations. So how did that really begin to shift your own perspective internally and make you start thinking about about the narrative that you wanted to tell within this film. Thanks, Mara. It's exciting to be here and talk about the film. Uh, yeah, The Reunited States was inspired first when I saw Susan Bro speak. Uh, she lost her daughter in Charlottesville when the car drove through the crowd and was able to speak with such clarity about the need to have difficult conversations in order to move past violence and avoid further violence. And it really hit me like a ton of bricks because I had just been like so many of us really passionate about politics after 2016 and in a way that it was consuming me. And here was someone who was able to be a voice of reason during this time. And so I approached her and I said, I think your wisdom could help a lot of people in this moment. You know, I don't know how or why, but I'd want to be a part of helping to tell your story. And she gave me her number and we started to have a conversation. And then I went to film with her on the first anniversary of Charlottesville. And the, the reunited States, it follows four storylines. Hers is one of them. But the main premise is that we all have a role to play in overcoming division. It's not something that just our government is doing or responsible for. This is a citizen problem. And that we all can be part of the solution too, depending on our thoughts, words, and actions towards the other side. And that was a radically different way to look at some of these issues. And we hope what will come out of the viewing experience. Yeah. And Mark Gerzon is, is a big part of the film and, and he actually wrote a book, The Reunited States, but you came up with the title of the film before discovering that he'd written the book and it was the checking to see if anybody already had that title. Um, and so I was interested in the first conversation that you had when you reached out to him about not only being involved in the project, but actually basing the film off of his book and off the work that he's been doing for over three decades a little bit as well. Yeah. Well, you've done your homework. Uh, that's yeah. That was exactly how we found each other was I thought I'd come up with the title, The Reunited States. And I was like, oh, this is too clever. And I Googled it and it led me to his book, which was not only the same name, but the same topic. And so I was, I was actually in Colorado where he's based on another project that was falling apart at the time. And I sort of threw a Hail Mary out to him and said, hey, I'm here, would you wanna meet? And we grabbed breakfast together and he was basically, you know, like I've been waiting for a filmmaker to approach me on this topic because I feel there's a uh, inconvenient truth style film that could come out of this to bring this, this movement into the public conscience. And by the way, how did you find me? And I told him the story of, of Googling him and he kind of sat back and scratched his chin and said, well, I guess it's meant to be then let's, let's go ahead and do this. And so he introduced me to the other three characters in the film because his book that he wrote, which is amazing, and there's a free download on our website at reunitedstates.tv of the ebook. Um, he profiled 40 people. Uh, it was sort of an anthology of short stories of people that were bridging the divide. And I didn't even know this movement existed. Like a lot of us, I think it's always like pick a side and battle it out. It's not, there's not as much awareness that there is a movement to, to bridge our divides. And so Anytime I needed someone, uh, I was like, what are the youth doing, you know, to, to fix this? And he said, go talk to Stephen Olacara. And I said, I want to follow someone on election night. And he said, talk to Greg Orman, the independent. And so that was how I, I sort of found the rest of the stories for the film. And with him making those introductions and really knowing who you should reach out to specifically, what was the roadmap for you in finding the types of voices that you really wanted to include to have a broad cross section of, of conversation within the movie? Yeah, that's, that's, that's always the most challenging part, I think, is finding stories that are compelling enough to convey what you, you know, universal ideas and what will make them entertaining. And, you know, one of the first things that people said when I was setting off is it's going to be hard because, you know, conflict is drama. And if you don't, if you have people that are trying to be peacemakers, that's not dramatic. And I, I kind of pushed back and I said, I disagree. I think if you find people going through transformation, that's incredibly dramatic, where they're challenging their own biases and beliefs in the world and watching them crumble, that can be very dramatic. And so first and foremost, we knew we had to find stories that were entertaining and emotional. And so that was a pretty high bar because 
it's one thing to, in a documentary, to have people looking back on an, an instance and telling you what happened and having some stock footage. It's another thing to try and find people that are going through that change right now and where you can be sort of a verite style and be a fly on the wall. And so uh, we did shoot a lot more stories than we ended up uh, using in the final film. But these four in the end were basically because they were the most uh, personal and emotional, but also because they showed that there's a lot of different ways to bridge the divide. It's not just one solution. There's many different ways to climb the mountain and they all reach the same higher truths. And so that was important that we had multiple storylines. And geographically, the story also covers multiple states, you know, both with where the individual subjects are located and the fact that you do have a pair of subjects with the Levertons who are traveling throughout the entire country in the making of this film to have these types of conversations. Was it always really important to you, given that you wanted to address the fact that this is a, you know, this is something that's happening across the country and this is something that people have the ability to have these types of conversations across the country was always really important to you from the offset geographically? Yeah, definitely. I think one of the problems is that we're all in our bubbles now and, you know, you're either living in a, some kind of coastal city or another big city or a, a rural or urban area. And there's so many different sides and faces to this country, whether it's the South or the Midwest or, you know, the coast, the Northeast, uh, the West. And, and even those are generalizations. Within that, there's so many microcosms. And so it was really important to try and find stories that showed different points of view that make up the tapestry of this country. I mean, part of the reason we have such divisions is that this country looks very different to you depending on the color of your skin or your gender or your socioeconomic status. And also the country looks upon you very differently. And so it's a little unfair to say we're going through the same experience and you just need to buck up and pick yourselves up by the bootstraps. How do you even do that if you don't have boots? And so a big part of this was just trying to make sure that we had people going through that transformation and seeing that their version of America is not the same version that everyone else lives in. Yeah. And with Greg Orman, you really use him as, as a symbol and a narrative that explores the broken elements of the two party system right now and him running as an independent. You know, when you first talked to Mark and, and were introduced to him, what was that moment where you just realized that he was specifically the exact voice that was really going to capture a much broader conversation about this political divide for you? I mean, to be honest, I was a little hesitant at first because, you know, uh, the idea of independence, never being able to penetrate our political system. It was something that I probably unconsciously believed that they were some kind of spoiler and were, you know, the system wasn't set up to for them to compete. But within one conversation, he completely changed my mind. And I think, you know, he's been doing this work for a while. Like he ran for Senate in 2014 in Kansas and almost won with the idea that if you could have just two independent senators, uh, it, more moderate, that could caucus with one side or the other, depending on the policy, that would literally break the gridlock in the Senate and completely change how people get approved and Supreme Court nominations and laws get passed. And that was, didn't seem so unachievable anymore. And he came very close to doing that. And so he had also written a book called The Declaration of Independence, ENTS, and has it's sort of been a manifesto for this. And there's a lot of exciting work out there that's leveling the playing field. I mean, you know, the two parties don't agree on anything, but there is one thing that they both agree on, which is they want to keep out other parties and other forces. And so they've made it very hard, but there are some policies and some reforms on the table, ranked choice voting, which is taking, it just got passed in Alaska. It's, it's, it's up for a uh, vote in California. And so there's, a, which would basically remove the idea that if you vote for uh, independent, you're basically letting the other person that you don't want to win in. And, and once you take that off the table, you change the, the way elections are run. And with the Levertons, David was actually part of the political system for a long time on the Republican side and then took a step back and, and started to feel like he was part of fueling a lot of the political divisiveness that was happening. And, and that's what really pushed him and his wife to take this trip on the road and to go around and have a lot of these conversations. And you go into his background in politics a little bit, but you don't necessarily dive specifically into a lot of the details of like where he was working and what he was involved in. What was the reason behind that specific decision narratively and why you felt that the film didn't really need that full exploration because it captured enough in what you were following? 
Yeah, the Levertons were incredible. David Leverton, as you mentioned, I mean, the, the long and short of their story is like you said, used to work in Republican politics, uh, realized that in any kind of political warfare, you're fomenting division and felt responsible for the divisions that were happening and wanted to go and be a part of helping to heal them after looking back on the work that he did. Uh, the specific, you know, he used to work for Senator Bob Corker from Tennessee. And there was a lot of interesting anecdotes that he told that we shot and recorded and, you know, basically saw his boss, who was a Republican, trying to work across the aisle with the other side and get excoriated by his own party. And, you know, a lot of stories of bridge building that were defeated because of uh, the two party system. And I, I think in the end, it was really a choice of is this as relevant to need to know this information, this level of detail? Because there's, you know, especially with four storylines, we wanted to make sure that you got into a person, in, invested in a person's story emotionally. And some of that stuff is more uh, academic or just, you know, detail oriented that sometimes distracts from the emotional impact of the story. Yeah. And obviously they trusted you in, in following them with a camera and telling their story, but it's not just their story that you're telling because they are going out on the road and they're having conversations with a lot of people in a lot of different spaces. And particularly I'm thinking about the woman who shares the story of, of losing her firstborn child because of inadequate medical care and the racism within the medical system. And she even says that she hasn't shared that story with a white person prior to that moment. So what was the journey of having conversations with people like her and making them also feel comfortable telling something that's very private and very personal to them on camera. Yeah, that scene in particular, which I, I think is one of the most powerful in the film um, emotionally, you know, it's it's the power of cinema. I, I, I don't think you can predict that to happen. You know, a lot of us, there, I, what I hope the film does is, is speak more uh, sensitively about issues of race and invite people into the conversation that might not have exposure to friends of color or, or communities of color. I think a lot of the reason that people, you know, have uh, their well-formed views about, you know, whether racism exists or not is just because they haven't had the opportunity to meet people that have, have suffered the consequences of it. And with that scene in particular, whether or not you believe that racism exists, it's hard to be a fly on that wall and not be emotionally moved by what she's saying and come to understand that maybe there's a little bit of truth to it. And that idea of being a fly on the wall and allowing others into hear this story that wouldn't have had the chance otherwise. And so I think the, the camera itself becomes a character or factor in these type of scenes because who's to say if the camera wasn't there that Michelle wouldn't have told this story. Like she maybe subconsciously realized that this was an opportunity to share this story on a much larger scale. And even if she didn't realize it at the time, that's ultimately what's happened uh, is, is something that the camera's role does play a responsibility in. And so I, I can't tell you if, uh, if that would have happened or not if we weren't there, but the fact that it did, there's some kind of alchemy um, that has allowed it to reach a lot more people and, and hopefully help a lot more people understand and heal. And there's a lot that people share with them and, and really give them of themselves in those conversations like that one. And, and we see it time and time again. But there is that moment later in the film when they're closer to the end of their journey where they're recanting the story of at the beginning, there being someone refusing to meet with them and just saying, you know, I think you need to do some work before we're ready to have this type of conversation together. And so I wanted to ask you about the way in which that scene and other moments were part of you really pulling together that idea of, you know, it's not just a case of looking to other people for answers but also there's conversations that people need to be having with themselves at the beginning and not relying on other people to do the work for them yeah i well that scene again is one that i think uh brings up that point beautifully that he you know david leverton when they were in atlanta reached out to a former civil rights leader an african-american man in his 80s at this point who'd seen a lot in his time in the south um who refused to meet with him and just said, even if I could meet with you, I wouldn't. And it's, it's hard to reconcile with someone who's got a boot on your neck. And, you know, I think that would at first be put a lot of people on the defense to hear that, to say like, wait a second, this guy is racist towards me, like thinking I'm like, you know, this oppressor or something. But the fact that, you know, that this person, this gentleman feels that he wakes up every day with a boot on his neck 
is not the America that David felt that he lived in. And I mean, even that metaphor gained so much more significance after George Floyd and the knee on his neck last summer. I, I was just really shocked at the, the parallels that, uh, you know, started to come out of the film and into what we're seeing in the, in the world. Um, but the idea that, yeah, until, you know, people have done their own work internally, it's really hard to have those external conversations. I think, you know, there's a lot of talk of the need for unity or talking across the aisle, but it takes a lot of self-examination for myself. It's been two and a half years on the journey of making this film where I started off being pretty far left and saying things like, if you voted for Trump, you're a racist. I mean, that's a pretty much a form of prejudice itself. And, and to blanket 70 million people with one term is, is, the, is the textbook definition of prejudice. And so I, you know, that internal work, and this is what we tried to build with not just the film, but the website, uh, reunitedstates.tv. It's an interactive experience of how to depolarize yourself and the things that you can be doing. Anytime you think you're like posting online about a cause you believe in, are you using language that's demonizing an entire group of people? Are you saying that, you know, those, uh, those people on that side are the problem? Um, that's, that's an overgeneralization. And those are things that we're all responsible for. So I love that you picked that up, the internal work that we need to do before we're ready to have those conversations. Yeah. You know, and, and you were mentioning some of the resources and, and details that you have on the website. And then you also have a pledge that you ask people to sign to kind of take accountability for themselves. What is it that you're hoping that people really internalize in themselves from, from reading that statement and, and signing that and kind of like just taking a pledge silently with themselves that nobody else even has to know about? Right. The Heal America pledge, it's on the website. The idea was that for those that feel moved to take action or are inspired to have a basic set of words that would help frame these ideas because they're, they seem easy at first to understand, okay, this is something I might be a part of, but it's actually can be quite traumatic to, to look at yourself and say, wait, I'm part of this problem. I thought I was the, on the good team. I thought I was battling the evil forces, but by me battling, is that also putting gas on the fire? And so we, we felt it was really important to have a pledge or uh, you know this kind of construct where by saying these words out loud, they could become more real, which to the effect of, I will resist de demonizing those I disagree with and instead listen to understand their concerns. That applies no matter where you are in the political spectrum because there are always the other or the people that we blame or think are the problem. And that in itself is part of the problem. I also thought one of the scenes in the film that was really striking was the moment where you have David and Aaron meet with Susan Bro, And it's really interesting to watch, you know, two sides of people who have been going out and having these conversations. And Susan actually comes to the table saying, I didn't want to meet David because I feel that you have been part of the problem and you have created part of the environment that impacted her daughter. And she's not accusing him of being responsible, but she's saying that he's part of the larger ecosystem that, that led to that incident. Um, was that something that you orchestrated with them meeting up? And, and at what point did you realize that those were Susan's feelings going into the conversation because I thought that was a really interesting exploration of, of watching people come into that uncomfortable space and really kind of go, come out of it on the other side because she says I wanted to meet you because I wanted to see the human side behind my feelings. Yeah it's uh you know that scene in particular was one of the only times that I the, the characters do meet each other um, because they were pretty much on their own journeys and it really came up because the Levertons decided on their own that after this 50 state road trip, they wanted to move to Charlottesville. And I had already been working with Susan in Charlottesville. And so it seemed like a logical interaction. They had been aware of each other. They'd actually met like a year before at an event uh, commemorating Charlottesville. But I did not know that Susan was going to come into the, the meeting like that. And I had sent her some information on the Levertons and they had, they had, you know, shot a video of explaining why they're going on this road trip and that he used to work in Republican politics. And she watched it that morning before coming to talk to them. And I think that by him admitting that he had been part of this mechanism fueling divisions, uh, it, it, it was, it triggered something in her that, you know, she had lost her daughter because of these divisions downstream. And so the idea of uh, wrestling with that, and it was quite brave of her to, to have that conversation on camera and also of, of David and Aaron to be able to 
receive that and be able to talk through it. I mean, the part that is not in the film is that there was, you know, another 45 minutes or an hour of conversation beyond that moment of them kind of finding resolution together. But it is, you know, indicative of how hard this work is. I think bridge building, the perception is it's kumbaya, let's all get together and, you know, let's just meet in the middle, which is not the case. It's very difficult. It's two steps forward, one step back. And so to have even bridge builders have conflict and difficult conversations and work through it was just a sign of just how how challenging this work is. And David and Aaron are doing this journey with with their kids in tow. Um, and we see their kids on camera throughout and, and going to all of these different locations with them. But you also made the choice to not interview the kids and ask them about their perspective on this experience, what it means to them, things that they've learned. Um, and so I wanted to ask about, did you, did you weigh up and consider interviewing the kids at any point and putting them on camera in that way? Or was it really just that they were part of the fabric of this experience that you wanted to be a fly on the wall for? You know, it's it's tricky with kids because, uh, of course, the parents were there and they would be consenting, you know, whether we used it or not. But uh, they're, they're such young, fragile, developing minds that I didn't want to put any more pressure on them than was already there with our presence. And so I didn't want to ask any tougher questions or probe any deeper. Um, there was a scene that we cut out where the David and Aaron talked about the impact this was having on their kids. And it was... A longer sequence about just the kids themselves and how amazing this experience is to see the country firsthand, but also to be in these museums, uh, like in Little Rock, Arkansas, and ask their parents, what does lynching mean? And their parents having to explain that to a five-year-old. And so uh, it was, again, we probably cut that out just for, for time and for a continuity of, of story, but the you can see in their eyes, and there are some references to this, how much this will impact their worldview moving forward. And what a gift that is that, you know, their parents didn't do this until their late thirties, but these kids are gonna grow up with that as part of their experience. And in working with Susan on the film and, and following her to all these different spaces, and we see her give a lot of speeches, but I imagine that you witnessed her in the room having conversations with people and, and giving speeches well beyond what we even get the opportunity to see in the movie. You know, what, what was that experience of really just seeing the power of those conversations that she was having, the energy shifting in the room from things that she was saying, and just the general change that's coming about, you know, even at a granular level from everything that she's putting herself into? Yeah, Susan is remarkable. I, you know, she, when we first met, she, she very cautiously approached me to understand where I was coming from, because she's frankly, you know, gotten it from both sides. A lot of people on the right, very far right, think that she's a crisis actress, and there's death threats against her. And people further left think that, uh, she's taking up all the oxygen about race as a white woman. And so, you know, she's agitated both sides and she always jokes that that means that she's doing something right. Um, but what I found most remarkable about her, and it took me a while to understand this, is that she speaks in an unfiltered way from the heart, which is not what most of us do. Most of us are kind of constantly thinking about the words coming out of our mouth and like what we should say and shouldn't say, what other people think about us. And I think it's because of her role as an educator. She used to be a uh, elementary school teacher. And so it's not much different talking to adults that have lost their manners. And the fact that she can call a spade a spade and, and say some pretty provocative things, but they don't feel provocative because we know they're true. The fact that she can say the only reason that people pay attention to me and still pay attention to me is because my daughter was white and she was killed. If she was a person of color, this probably wouldn't have got this news attention. But the fact that she looks like the people that are reporting on this is part of the problem. And the fact that she can say that and that it can cut through all of the noise and clutter to this universal truth and self-awareness is what makes her so powerful and have so much staying power. Yeah. Well, congratulations on the way that you've managed to approach and, and tell this story and particularly at this point in time with everything. And thank you so much for this conversation. Thanks, Mara. I really enjoyed it. I uh, hope everyone gets a chance to check out the film. If you need a little bit of hope about the state of our country, this is it.